Okay, welcome everyone to the Technique Tuesday finale. So far in this series, we've covered more than 30 exercises that I am a fan of, exercises that I think would be smart to include in any complete training program, depending on your goals. And in this video, I'm gonna share 10 exercises that I'm not so much of a big fan of, and that I think most people with muscle and strength building goals probably shouldn't prioritize doing in the gym. Now I should say up front that this generally isn't how I approach my training. I actually don't think that there are many, if any, inherently good or bad exercises, just better and worse choices depending on the goal. And I think this quote from Dr. Brett Contreras summarizes my view perfectly. Injuries in the weight room have more to do with poor form than the exercise itself. Exercises are tools, you're the carpenter. A good carpenter never blames his tools. And then in the same article, he points out that with enough knowledge of biomechanics and anatomy, you could easily make a case for why every exercise in the book should be avoided. Um, so that isn't my purpose here. Even the exercises on my list might not be completely useless in all circumstances, and I don't think any of them are inherently harmful. It's just that they aren't the ones that I'd broadly recommend. So if you find some of your favorite exercises on this list, that's okay. You still might be able to modify them in the ways that I suggest, or you could use an alternative or just continue using it if you find it working well for you. Um, so with that out of the way, let's dig into my top 10 least favorite exercises with number one being my least favorite on the list. Okay, so number 10 on my list is gonna be the standing dumbbell external rotation. This one is really common in beginners, and it isn't so much that it's actively harmful, it's just not effective. So the whole point behind external rotations is to warm up and strengthen the rotator cuff. And I love doing them as a prehab drill when done with cables or bands as they strengthen the external rotators such as the rear delts and infraspinatus. However, when you use a dumbbell while standing, gravity isn't being applied properly. Gravity is pulling the dumbbell down in the sagittal plane while external rotation is happening in the transverse plane. In other words, the dumbbell is adding absolutely no tension against external rotation. So holding the dumbbell like this only adds tension to the biceps, and unless you're trying to isometrically work the biceps, you might as well just do body weight external rotations with no dumbbell. But in my experience, it's much more practical to just do these using cables or bands. Number nine on my list is the above the knee rack pull. Now I should say I really don't hate the above the knee rack pull, but I do think there are more efficient ways to accomplish what some people use the exercise for. Now if you're using them to build deadlifts strength, I think you'd be much better off using a lower block pull. That's gonna have more carry over to the actual deadlift itself. And if you're struggling with lockouts, I think the hip thrust is better for building glute strength as it loads the glutes much better in full hip extension. Now, I would agree that it can be effective for heavily overloading the traps isometrically. However, taking the traps through a full range of motion by doing shrugs or cable shrug ins could offer the same benefit without the need for loading up as much weight. And the main issue that I have with this exercise is slamming around so much weight can damage gym equipment. So unless you have access to a private gym or bring your own bars, I don't think it's the best gym etiquette. Okay, up next is the cable squat, another exercise that applies tension in the wrong direction. Here the cable is pulling you forward into the machine, meaning it's mostly challenging your balance without adding much, if any, tension to your quads or glutes. Ultimately, I think this exercise amounts to a body weight squat that trains your balance a little bit. Now, I will say that it can be useful for teaching the squat in beginners as it forces you to stay a bit more upright, but I'd say past the rank beginner level, I really think people should graduate onto a squat variation that loads the movement pattern axially, such as the barbell back squat, front squat, goblet squat, or even a machine squat or hack squat, would be much better for applying an overloading stimulus. So since we're on the topic of squats, number seven may come as a surprise to some people, and it's the act to grass squat. I find a lot of people who get passionate about lifting take on this idea that unless you're squatting as deep as possible, it doesn't count. Now I should say it isn't that I think that there's anything necessarily wrong with going very deep on squats, if you can do it safely, but I also know that many trainees simply won't have the mobility or the skeleton to do so. And if they're squatting for muscle and general strength building purposes, a parallel squat is perfectly acceptable. Of course, if you're a competitive power lifter, you'll have to get your hip crease below the knee joint in order for the lift to count in competition. But for people just looking to build size and strength, I think the risk to reward ratio really starts to escalate the deeper you get below parallel. Plus, most often when you squat deeper than your anatomy allows, you're not actually taking the knees or the hips through any extra range of motion anyway. And more often than not, you're just gonna end up rounding the lower back, which only increases risk of injury. So I would say squat as deep as you comfortably can, and I'll link some resources in the description box below that might be helpful in determining what your squat depth should be. 
Okay, up next we have the hack squat machine shoulder press. Now this exercise makes the list mostly just because I don't think it's necessary. I mean, if you really feel this in your shoulders, then that's fine. But I find most convoluted uses of machines that aren't designed to be used in the way that you're using them probably aren't adding anything that a more basic variation would already accomplish. And the same thing goes for the shoulder press machine shrug, where you stand on the seat and do shrugs. I mean, there are just so many other ways you could set this up using dumbbells, cables, a trap bar, or a bar. Bell. And I'm definitely open to being creative and experimenting, but this one is just really uncomfortable for my shoulders. It locks me in and I'd much rather just do a dumbbell press or a machine shoulder press that was designed for this purpose. Okay, number five on my list is the Landmine T-Bar Cheat Row with a really upright posture. You guys will remember from my videos on rowing that to maximize the range of motion for the lats, you want your torso to be close to perpendicular to the line of pull. So by sitting all the way back and keeping a very upright posture, you're really reducing the range of motion to no advantage other than just going heavier. And I would say that's a trade-off that I don't think is worth it if your main goal is building size and avoiding injury. Now granted, I know many bodybuilders have built impressive backs doing cheat rows, so it isn't so much that they're a useless exercise, it's just that from a cost-benefit perspective, you'd probably get more out of reducing the weight, leaning more forward, and maintaining better control. Up next, we've got curling in the squat rack. Yeah, this isn't really an exercise itself, but I do still see a lot of guys doing these in busy commercial gyms, and I think it's really bad gym etiquette because you can easily set up a barbell to curl anywhere in the gym, but you can only set up a squat in the squat rack. And this is especially bad if you're loading up way more weight than you can handle with good form. But with that said, if you're in an empty gym or there's clearly a bunch of squat racks open, I guess there's nothing wrong with banging out a few curls. But if you see someone roll up with their lifting belt and knee sleeves, I'd be respectful and take your curls elsewhere. Okay, number three on this list also might surprise some people and it's the front raise. And it isn't so much that the front raise is bad or dangerous, it's a fine exercise. It's just almost guaranteed to be redundant in any typical bodybuilding program. Most bodybuilders already have overdeveloped front delts relative to their side and rear delts, and many new lifters tend to focus on muscles they can see in the mirror. You couple this with the fact that any horizontal and vertical pressing in your program is already gonna heavily tax the front delts, adding in extra isolation work for the front delts, in the best case is gonna be redundant, and in the worst case, it could exacerbate existing imbalances. So the fix here is pretty simple. Anytime you go to do front raises, do side raises, or bent over or reverse flies instead, create more balance across all heads of the deltoid. All right, number two on my list of least favorite exercises is the behind the neck pull down and the behind the neck press. Now I'll start by saying that I don't think everyone who does this exercise is gonna end up in the hospital. I know plenty of trainees who have the mobility to do this movement just fine, and it's actually never given me any problems on the few occasions that I've experimented with it. However, when it comes to the behind the neck lat pull down, I'm aware of at least one study showing it to have lower lat activation compared to simply pulling to the front. And when it comes to the behind the neck press, just because you can force the shoulder to perform pure abduction, it doesn't mean there's any advantage in doing so. And I actually think a traditional OHP combined with a lateral raise would be more effective. Um, so they aren't my favorite because they tend to lead to less overloading. They're awkward to perform for most lifters. And they tend to impose a greater injury risk for most people. And most importantly, they just don't seem to offer any noticeable benefit from a hypertrophy perspective. So unless you definitely have the shoulder mobility to do these safely and you really find your delts or lats responding well to them, I think it's much smarter to go with pull downs and presses brought to the front. Okay, and the number one exercise, meaning it's my least favorite exercise on this list, is the BOSU ball curl or the BOSU ball squat. Now, first of all, I'm assuming most viewers of my channel want to build muscle and gain strength. So while these might have some application in some scenario, for the vast majority of lifters, you're going to get much more out of the curl in terms of biceps growth by doing it on a stable surface, since you'll be able to overload the biceps more, control the movement better, and create a better mind-muscle connection. And the same thing goes for the squat. Now, I would say most people using BOSU balls are probably using them because they're supposed to be more functional. However, as pointed out in this 2010 ACSM article from Brad Schoenfeld, it's misleading to characterize an exercise as either functional or non-functional. Uh, for example, for a trainee who's very unfit, a routine including only non-functional machines would in fact be very functional in terms of helping them carry out their everyday activities. So clearly the functionality of an exercise exists on a continuum. Regardless, a 2010 position stand concluded that from a performance standpoint, unstable devices shouldn't be utilized when hypertrophy, strength, or power is the goal because force generation, power, and velocity are impaired. So in my opinion, these unstable surface exercises should be avoided by most trainees going for strength and size since they hinder performance while increasing risk of injury. 
And with that, we're gonna bring this part of the series to a close. I think this has been my favorite series so far to make because I just find that technique really captures both the art and the science of training. Um, so I really appreciate you guys who've followed along since the beginning. Um, so my plan from here is to get the Science Applied series going again, take you guys through some full body workouts from my new program, which is coming soon. And then sometime in the new year, I'm gonna launch an advanced Technique Tuesday series where I'm gonna cover some more specialized training techniques that I think you guys are really gonna enjoy. And I'll put a link to the full Technique Tuesday playlist over here if you guys wanna check out all of the 30 something exercises that we've covered. As always, don't forget to leave the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one. I should have added some more across this list. Okay, all right. I'm not gonna lie, bro. The, the squeeze on that is actually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks good. Well, I clearly have any hair from the Okay, ready? Hold up. Try one more time. Two, go. <laughs> The nerd Jeff? The regular Jeff. Oh. <laughs> okay, ready? Yep, yep.